when the steel hull of the sail-powered merchantman Pass of Balmaha slid into the water for the first time in 1888, no one could have guessed she'd become one of the most famous German merchant raiders of all time. Well, apart from anything else, she was being built in Scotland for a British company. Displacing around 4,500 tonnes, the ship was a typical medium sail merchantman of the late 19th century, designed for routes where fuel was either potentially not available readily or reliably, or the speed of passage just wasn't a major concern for the cargo in question. Powered, therefore, by her three masts and their attendant sails, she was, in theory, cheap to operate, since, of course, there was no fuel cost or machinery maintenance involved, her multiplicity of small sails reflecting the minimal crew that she carried. Larger sails would have needed more men. She plied her trade for the next two and a half decades, relatively quietly, passing through several owners, but always retaining her British-flagged status. However, this would all change when World War I broke out. British-flagged vessels were, of course, liable to be attacked, but the ship at this point was under the control of American industrial interests, who would then see her re-registered under the American flag, which in theory would allow her freer passage as a neutral vessel. By summer 1915, she was sailing for Russia with cargo when she was intercepted by the Victorian, a British ocean liner turned armed merchant cruiser, which ordered her to stop for inspection. For some reason not entirely content with the ship's papers, the Victorian left a prize crew aboard with orders to sail to the Orkneys so the ship could undergo further checks. The prize crew raised the white ensign instead of the stars and stripes to signify that the ship was now under British control, but this meant that a few days later, when the German submarine U-36 found them, she surfaced and ordered the ship to heave to as a hostile vessel. The ship's captain then rehoisted the American flag and got the British prize crew hidden, with some sources suggesting he retook the ship and locked them up immediately, whilst others suggest that at first at least he was just trying to hide them, but then decided to keep them locked up later. For the Germans, it didn't actually matter all that much, because if she was flying the White Ensign, she was British and therefore a legitimate prize, and if they believed the American captain's story, then she was American, but she was taking a cargo that the Germans deemed to be contraband of war to a hostile port, namely the one in Russia, and so she was still going to be impounded. And so, with a prize crew numbering exactly one, the ship was now on a course for Germany. In exchange for the British prize crew, which they took prisoner, the Germans allowed the American crew to leave, but the Germans were keeping the ship. By this point in the war, most German raiders had been stopped, either directly by force or indirectly by mechanical breakdown, which in turn had sometimes led to their interception. But some bright spark realised that a sailing ship couldn't ever truly run out of fuel, or have an engine breakdown, since it wouldn't have an engine, and so in the world of dreadnoughts, one of the world's most unlikely merchant raiders was created. Fitting the ship with a pair of 4.1 inch guns and a couple of machine guns, and to be fair, a 900 horsepower auxiliary diesel engine, the vessel was placed under the command of Captain Felix von Luckner and sent out to sea at the end of 1916. Her large cargo holds had been converted into fairly luxurious accommodation and entertainment spaces for her crew and their supplies, and in fact, so much space was available without much in the way of machinery that even the prisoners' quarters were somewhat better than most berthing that was found on regular ships. The first part of the voyage had to get past the British blockade of Germany. This was accomplished relatively easily, despite being boarded by HMS Avenger, another armed merchant cruiser, as most of the crew had been picked in part because they spoke fluent Norwegian, and so they were disguising themselves pretending to be a Norwegian vessel. Passing between the northern tip of the UK and the southern coast of Iceland, the newly christened SMS Seadler headed west until roughly halfway to Canada before turning south to start raiding in earnest. This was a slightly odd choice of name, as technically speaking there was still an old cruiser, which was also SMS Seadler, 
in service with the German Navy, albeit the latter vessel was now a storage hulk, so perhaps that freed up the name. Either way, the raider settled into a rather standard pattern, taking her first two ships near the Azores. Say Adler would coast into range of her chosen target, then reveal her guns, and if that failed to get the other ship to stop and heave to, she would fire some warning shots, which would cause the ship to stop then, then inspect the vessel and take the crew off before sinking the target. Where needed, she would also take off supplies to re restock her own first, and in this manner she headed south, taking another ten prizes, all fellow sailing vessels, in the waters between Brazil and Western Africa. Her final prize in this area, the French bark Cambron, was allowed to remain afloat, being used to carry the multiplicity of prisoners the ship had acquired into Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. Then it was off around the southern tip of South America and into the Pacific, as America by this stage had entered the war, and so three American schooners were stopped, captured and sunk over the summer of 1917 in the Central Pacific the previous targets in the Atlantic having been almost exclusively French or British. But by this stage, after over half a year at sea, the hull had become somewhat fouled, and so she headed south to the isolated island of Mopelier, or Mopelia, which was technically in French hands, but had a grand total population of three. Unfortunately, the ship proved a bit too big to get into the harbour, and so had to anchor nearby in open water. What happened next is a little bit debated. Luckner, in his book published after the war, described a tsunami or rogue wave smashing the ship onto the reefs, whilst some of the American prisoners who were aboard and then taken onto the island claim that, in actual fact, she dragged her anchor and ran aground while most of the crew was ashore and unable to do anything about it. Either way, the ship ended up being wrecked and beyond recovery. After salvaging what they could, including various ship parts which allowed them to build shelters on the island, the rest of the ship was supposed to be burned, but it didn't really work all that well, what with all the water and steel around. After a few weeks on the island, Luckner worked out a plan to sail, along with five others, in one of the surviving ship's boats to Fiji, hijack another ship, and then come back for the rest of the crew. He actually managed to sail the tiny craft all the way to Fiji, but was then caught and imprisoned on the island. The rest of the crew, in the meantime, found and seized a small French ship that had turned up, but they then ran it aground on Easter Island and so were interned by Chile. The crew of the French ship and the American prisoners were now stuck on the original island, and so four of the Americans took Say Adler's other boat and they headed for American Samoa, also managing to complete the navigation, and they were able to summon help for the rest of the men who were stuck back on the island. Thus, the escapades of Say Adler finally came to an end, at least mostly, as Luckner later made a good go at trying to escape, but that's a story for another day. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review, let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to comment on the pinned post for dry dock questions.